the field of cryptography as we know it today is approximately a century old. Right? As I say, it has some, some prehistory. Um, all of the cryptographic systems, except for the key management systems that we use, you can trace directly to the Renaissance. They basically involve two things. In computer, modern computer science terms, you have some kind of a, an arithmetic, uh, whether it's normal numeric arithmetic or some sort of Galois field arithmetic, but uh, some, some sort of group. And you have lookup tables. And that's the, that's the backbone of the cryptography that encrypts most of the bits in the world today. But as an organizational phenomenon, as 99% oh, of its complexity or something, everything dates from the introduction of radio in 1903. Before radio, information security, which may or may not have had that name, but it was about you know, locked cabinets and to some extent about vetting personnel and lab labeling documents, things of that sort. And radio suddenly hit and it bypassed every security measure known up to that point with the single exception of cryptography, which wasn't very real at that time. Right? Cryptography in 1900 was almost entirely done with code books. You could encrypt a few words a minute. Um, I heard an anecdote I haven't been able to get to the bottom of that in the First World War, an un unclassified message could get from Washington to Paris you know, within hours or something. And a secret one took a couple of days because the queues for the code clerks were so long. And so basically what happened is that suddenly you needed cryptography because the, you can't avoid radio. Radio is just so wonderful. You're going to go out of business or lose the war or whatever if you don't avail yourself of radio. But now you have as a primary security measure what previously had been a secondary security measure and they were completely swamped. So some Dutch Navy people during the First World War, 1915 or so, cooked up the first of a system, series of systems that are known as Enigma that operate with little wired wheels. Several people invented them around the world at once, uh, a little later than that but a little earlier than what used to be created is the invention of Enigma. A man named Hebern in Oakland, California is seen as in many ways the technical root of, of American cryptography. And these things were basically mechanizations of what were called polyalphabetic ciphers that dated from the Renaissance. And they had never really seriously been used because you can't do them by hand. Uh, sufficiently well, they're error prone and so forth, do them by hand. The minute you mechanize them, you get what's called a six-fold or so visionaire cipher. Encrypts each character by looking it up six times in tables. That's just something a human being can't do with a low enough error rate for the cipher to be usable. And that notion, the wired wheel systems, dominated cryptography essentially from, they say, 1920 to perhaps as late as 1960 or maybe even 1970. The two things are worth noting about what I'll call the early period of this. One is the highest grade American system. It's called SIGABA which was in, developed about 1935 because a very smart man named Frank Rowlett who lived in Sarasota most of the latter part of his life after he retired. Um, <clears throat> he was assigned an awful job. His boss had cooked up maybe the worst crypto system ever designed. Uh, his boss is very famous and justifiably so. His name is Billy Friedman. But the crypto system used a one-time tape so you have a piece of Bordeaux tape with five sprocket holes. And then you have a five-wheel machine. And the wheels of the machine move according to whether there's a one or a zero on the tape. Well, this, in fact, adds nothing over just XORing, you know, adding the bit, adding the character on the tape to the character of plain text. But it introduces a truly wonderful uh, failing. You get a single bit error 
in synchronization between the two tapes, and now you have a sync error in the machines that goes on indefinitely. Okay? So he was assigned to manufacture pairs of tape that were identical. And that, I don't know, even as late as I started working in the 1960s, you know, we had this joke about tape for reading and tape for writing, and they weren't the same kind of tape. Error rates of paper tape were quite high. And so Frank Rowlett is doing this mindless job, you know, trying to manufacture these, these tapes. And he comes up with the idea of using, a, they were manufacturing, I don't know the details, they seem to have been lost, uh, but they were sort of using rotor machines to manufacture key at the time. I don't know what the real random element was. But he came up with this notion of just incorporating the rating, the rotor machine that manufactured the key into the into the crypto device. And it comes up with a device called SIGABA. It's got two banks of five wheels. One of them are called the encoding rotors or something like that, and they actually process the traffic. And the others are called the control rotors, and they manufacture the, the motions for the five uh, ciphering rotors. And they do that. There's, there's, that much, I mean, that's cooperating finite automata. That component is just universally present in crypto systems today. The other piece of it is <clears throat> insanely clever, and I can find no way of applying it to any current system. Uh, modern jargon for it would be multiprocessing in the rotor maze. In the control rotors, you put four signals in at the left end. You don't just put one. After all, they're all permutations. You, you put current on two wires that won't have any effect on each other. They'll just move independently through the rotors. So you put on four, and that means there are four hot spots coming out at the right side. And then you gather those by what's called wire oaring, wire bundles, together into five components, and you feed those to the solenoids that drive the cipher rotors. The effect is you have something that, if you think about that scheme, it's always going to move, and it can never, what the British call lobster, it can never have all its rotors move at once. And both those things, both failing to move and lobstering, are considered um, vulnerabilities. So anyway, SIGABA continued in use till 1957. There's one on the web. Um, I think it's on the submarine Pompano, is, which is uh, birthed in San Francisco Bay. And uh, I can't remember the name of the people involved now, but there, that has been uh, well documented, and you can find out more about SIGABA now than you want to know. The other interesting early period thing, and I think you should think about this one very carefully, is there's a crypto system called various things by the Japanese, the Type 97 or the Type B, called by the US Purple which got a lot more airplay than some things because it played a role in the congressional inquiry about the Pearl Harbor uh, attack of 1941. And Purple was, in respects, the highest grade Japanese system. It was used for embassy communications. And it's remembered badly because it was a crummy crypto system. We broke it. We broke it without ever, you know, just from traffic alone. Uh, and <clears throat> Yet it embodies one of the best ideas of early 20th century cryptography. It doesn't use rotors, although it operates on the same basic mathematical principles. It uses stepping switches. Now the critical difference is that nobody but cryptographers were ever interested in rotors. Right? I mean, it's, so that means you have to develop them out of the communication security budget, which is not very large. Stepping switches were used to build telephone central offices. You go buy them from Western Electric or Nippon tele Telegraph and Telephone. And they was well known you could build central offices had thousands or tens of thousands of these switches. They ran with incredible reliability. Now that that lesson that you should build things out of standard parts that somebody else is paying for. Right? It's very, I think that's funny. Boy, that's the heart of this business is to profit off somebody else paying for something. Um, 
And then my boss, Jonathan Schwartz, likes to say, you know, if you develop your own software, you get $1 worth of software for every dollar you develop in the investment. In invest in it. If you buy software that's sold to large markets, right, then you pay much, much less for it because the developers are over the market that they're serving, of which you are only a small part. So that is true of crypto systems as well. Now, the third thing that I want to discuss is a object called Sig. Sig Sally was the first genuine secure telephone. Uh, and in some ways, it's remarkably contemporary. Per second. And, you know, we. I don't know what we're doing currently. There's a lot of ISDN, but as late as Stu 3s, you certainly had a 2400 bit per second vocoder as, as the minimal essential requirement. And Sig Sally happened to have done two different crypto codes. It had, a, uh, it had an actual crypto system with a crypto principle that, once again, something better placed researchers than I say they can't find out now exactly how it worked. But the main thing that it did. I'm down to 45 minutes. I'd better think of something else to say. Um, the main thing that it did was that it ran one-time tape off of long-playing records. So you had a couple of disc jockeys synchronizing the conversation and uh, playing these records. And then after the, after the thing was over, the records would be smashed so that they could, could never be used again. And the, one, the important difference between Sig Sally and contemporary secure telephones was it occupied a room about this size. It fitted in 37 foot tall racks of equipment. Uh, it weighed, you know, 30 ish tons. Those racks are about a ton apiece. And I don't know how many million dollars it cost. And the result was it had a very small market. Initially, only Roosevelt and Churchill could afford one. Eventually, by the end of the 40s, all of the four star generals in the US managed to get one. So there are a dozen of them or something of that kind. Army wasn't as big then, it was downsizing. And <clears throat> but what that did was show the possibility of real secure voice. And immediately everybody began, you know, dreaming about that. Because during the Second World War, you had at least at um, maybe down to division level, I'm not sure how far it goes, but you had these SIGABAs. Um, and some other devices that give you high-grade security for teletype traffic, 10 characters a second. You had some voice scramblers, but they weren't any good. So basically, you're living with an environment where you can only, only have secure text. Suddenly, you see the prospect of, at first, secure voice. And then, of course, somebody will have been thinking about secure video and things like that beyond that. And mechanical devices just won't work anymore. And the thing that replace them, and incidentally, here's another hole in my historical knowledge. I'm pretty sure this has an explanation of the stepping switch kind, but I can't, I can't find it. The best I can find is that, that shift registers were what we used for doing bit serial arithmetic in the computers that were being built circa 1950. At any event, um, within a period of a decade, shift register crypto systems appear all over the world. And they are generally of two forms, but the main thing that was done is that you take what's called a linear shift register, something that's computing something easily described by linear algebra, which is great because you have things like being able to calculate its period and knowing that it won't circle back on itself. But of course, by itself, it won't do because the cryptanalytic problem is just one of solving linear equations. and People are quite good at that. And so then you have some non-linearization element, and there are two basic ways of doing it, and lots of things do both. One is to, quote, stutter the register. So it either pauses or skips, or maybe skips further distances. So you're getting an irregular decimation of the sequence. And the other is a nonlinear output combiner that taps several stages of the register and combines them in a nonlinear way. And finally, you get a bit of output that's XORed with a bit of plain text. And these things, uh, were still in use, um, were hot you know, throughout um, the 50s and 60s and, and 70s. And the point at which I and my community come onto the scene is the early 1970s. At that point, 
a couple of things are happening that weren't all visible to me. There's a man named Horst Feistel, going back a little bit, who worked for the Air Force. Horst Feistel is a, a fascinating character. born in 1914. Immigrated to the U.S. in 1934. He was just about to become a U.S. citizen when the Second World War started. So instead, he gets put under house arrest. And, he, and not quite literally, but he had to tell his case officer if he went from Boston, where he lived, to New York to see his mother. He was living there. And then, I think it's January 31st, uh, 1943, he's given his citizenship. The 1st of February, he's given a top secret clearance, and he goes to work for the Air Force Cambridge Research Center. And Feistel had been interested since he was a teenager in cryptographic things, and he begins to talk about that, and people said, Horst, it's not the time for a German to be talking about cryptography. And he got sort of delayed, but 1950-ish, he discovered um, there was... TERF, of course, and NSA, which was, I guess, at the time still called AFSA, was fighting for TERF, and in its relations with the Air Force, which is also big on fighting for TERF, the Air Force was saying, you know, we have this problem of a solid, positive identification of aircraft, uh, the current techniques are not working that well, we think it needs cryptography, NSA said, you know, we'll get around to you, we're busy reading the Russian traffic or something like that. The Air Force said, we're not going to lose any pilots while you get around to us. And they set up a, uh, a laboratory. They began working on, on building uh, cryptographic IFF devices, it, which cannot incidentally have been built significantly earlier because um, you really needed transistors to build something of this complexity and fit it into the, into the f form factors of the radars. You know, this is one of these things. Working in security, you probably experienced this. You get called into the problem after all the critical decisions that you needed to influence have been made in the wrong direction. Right? So, I mean, you can, of course, you, know, you could build a cryptographic device that would do these things well, out of tubes if you had to. But the critical thing is, oh, no, no, you get one seven inch high by four inch wide by maybe it's just 15 inches deep slot inside and you know inside this radar and you'd better make it fit in there and run within the power budget and run off the you know 28 volt supply and all the rest of that kind of stuff so Feistel discovered the activities of the group that was doing this and was convinced the system wasn't secure and got his group the mathematics group I think to work on it and indeed they succeeded in breaking it they made a critical improvement in it and that thing became what's called the Mark 12 called the KI-1, the uh, cryptographic identification device 1, went into the Mark 12 IFF and is still in use. Uh, Feistel was monomaniacal. I mean, he was only interested in cryptography. By the late 50s, NSA won the turf war. Air Force had no great further direct interest in the subject. Feistel had to go looking for a job. He went to Lincoln Laboratory. He lasted there for a couple of years. He went to MITRE, where I could have met him. He was still there when I arrived in 65, but I didn't meet him at that time. Uh, at MITRE, he was, <clears throat> once again, trying to work on cryptography, but our, uh, our main customers uh, weren't with him, and he had to get on the road again. This time, he did the right thing. He went to IBM. And IBM was not, had a big federal customer, but it wasn't its dominant or only customer. And IBM had banking customers, and it set up a group to do cryptographic development. And ultimately, that development, now this is now, we're now up to their first paper is 1969. So we're up to the early 70s. What is the situation? Well, most of cryptography is still secret. Fine. Uh, in, the, in the US, NSA is the big repository of that activity. and they're remarkably uh, unforthcoming. Um, at IBM, and unknown to me until I was a year or so into this activity, um, there's a cryptographic do group doing work that is not, not much like most of the direct cryptographic development that's been done in NSA. Uh, the, the virtue of block ciphers had yet to be seen, and this is probably just a matter of the cost of hardware. Right? In essence, what you need in block ciphers is wider data paths. And I will try to get to that point a little bit later. So I had, I owe NSA a great deal, and the first thing I owe them uh, is that in the 
summer of 1972, Larry Roberts, who was the head of the Information Processing Techniques Office at ARPA, uh, approached Howard Rosenblum, who was the Deputy Director for Communication Security at NSA, and he said, you know, we need help with security of the ARPANET. This is a prototype military command and control network for the whole country, and uh, it needs security. But they couldn't come to any deal because Roberts didn't want to support any secret work, and Rosenblum didn't want to do any public work. So Roberts comes back and he begins talking to his principal investigators about this problem that he sees. And one of those is my boss, John McCarthy. And John comes back from Washington and he begins talking to his, to his staff about, about the, this problem of network security. But at the time, it, you know, it turned into the problem of cryptography in all our minds. We don't see it that way now. But so several of us began uh, thinking about cryptography, and most of the rest of them stopped thinking about it uh, within a few weeks or a couple of months. Uh, I, one of them, um, um, Hans Moravec, who's now head of the robotics laboratory at CMU, wrote a, coded a crypto system for John McCarthy uh, to John McCarthy's, to some specs that John McCarthy had, which incidentally involved ideas he'd gotten from a Russian machine called the Bessem 6 that had in it called spread and gather, which are in there indeed for cryptanalytic reasons. They, they do things close to the heart of shift registers. And he got this idea of using one shift register sequence to decimate another shift register sequence. This thing was later rediscovered at IBM and is called a shrinking generator. And Moravec coded it. Moravec added another feature, which we now call key escrow. It carefully put the key where he could find it, just in case he should want to read any of this traffic later. Uh, so uh, by nine months later, I was the only one still thinking about this subject. And John McCarthy was thoroughly fed up with me because I was being supported under the table by NSA to work on proof of correctness of programs, right? which I saw as the most important problem in modern engineering. And I still see it, but I'm very glad that I got out of it because it's made rather less progress than the field I moved into. Um, and I began traveling around. Uh, you know, I had sort of three uh, looking for people who were interested in talking about the subject and thinking about it a lot and uh, looking at the literature was hard to find. I was traveling around university libraries and such, digging up the literature and made two discoveries. You know, well, my first discovery is my wife, Mary Fisher, uh, whom I met, uh, fundamentally met during the, the first summer uh, of this travel. And a year and a half or so, a year later, um, we went to visit Alan Conheim, who was the head of the mathematics group at IBM, whom we knew by then. They had then released some of their papers on the directions to DES. And so I went to see him. I actually did it by going to see a man named Alan Tritter, who was, called himself the biggest man in computer science. Uh, that is, he weighed 500 pounds. And Conheim didn't want to tell me very much. He said, we're under a secrecy order here. I can't tell you anything. But you should go look up my old friend Marty Hellman back at Stanford, because two people can work on a problem better than one. Now he wishes he'd never said that. But I went, we went back to Stanford. Uh, I went, had a half hour appointment with Marty. This stretch to, uh, from 4.30 in the afternoon to 11 at night, around 6, we got hold of our wives. We went back to his place. We were immensely congenial as families. Uh, his mother-in-law is a dog breeder. My wife can recognize 300 breeds of dog at a glance. It all, you know, and each of us, Marty and I, each found the other one, the best informed person, willing to talk about cryptography that he'd yet met in this quest. And we worked together for four years and became uh, a big pain in uh, Alan Conheim's ample back end. Uh, and he felt he knew Marty before, and he felt Marty had betrayed him in this. We opposed the adoption of the data encryption standard, which was put forth um, spring of 75, well, February 75, <clears throat> on the grounds that it wasn't secure enough. And in retrospect, we were both right and wrong, right? I mean, it, yes, uh, except for the politics of the matter, you wouldn't ever have put out a system with a 56-bit key uh, because it did have to be changed in 25 years. But on the other hand, and maybe should have been changed a bit earlier than that, but on the other hand, it was adequate for the time, and it, uh, it made a major advance, actually, conceptually, not only in civilian, but in military cryptography. 
the same Howard Rosenblum mentioned before, thought he'd like to have a military encryption standard. And another version was done internally that became one of the major um, cryptographic algorithms the US uses. Uh, and it, ch the, it led them to recognize that the falling cost of gates, roughly speaking, made it feasible to devote enough gates to use a block cipher as the backbone of everything. And instead of having, you can get, make shift register systems go very fast. And it looks like you, know, you have to go through the 16 or something rounds of a block cipher uh, before you get the output out. It looks rather slow until you understand how it can be parallelized. And then suddenly you find that you can build very, very fast systems in such a way that you can have a simple cookbook of modes of operation that allow you to fill all your needs from a smaller number of primitives. And there is another fundamental principle. The big cost in cryptography is evaluation. And so the fewer systems you have to maintain, and it's, I mean, you, in a well-run cryptographic establishment, you have every system in the field under continuing evaluation. You might even have them evaluate evaluation after the withdrawn, because you may want to know the consequences of old traffic becoming readable. So you have a high cost of the evaluation and certification part of your operation, and you'd like to focus it onto as, as few systems as possible and have those built out of as few basic techniques as possible so that you can study those most intently. So um, I left spring of 1973. I left the Artificial Intelligence Laboratory at Stanford. and. Fall of 74, I met Marty Hellman and once again had a sort of a job. I was uh, research, had a part-time research assistancy, assistance for me. And I began, I was working, I'd spent about two years in some sense thinking about the requirements for cryptographic systems, much more than about cryptographic systems themselves. And then I got to thinking, I, I had a wonderful situation in the spring of 75. My wife and I were babysitting Professor John McCarthy's younger daughter. I mean, she was 13 or 14 or something. She couldn't drive yet. So you can't live in California without being able to drive. And we took her to school and stuff like that. And we were living in his house. And I, my wife was working and taking care of us. And I had the place to myself. And it had a luxury that everyone has now and very few people had then. He had a five kilobit connection to the lab. So I didn't even have to go over the lab to work. I, I could sit in his study and work. And he was off in Japan. And I got to thinking about how to combine the two things I knew about. One is this IFF, which I had learned about. And the other is um, the Unix password system. Now these two things protect you against very different threats. One protects you against, loosely speaking, shoulder surfing. Right? You watch a fighter and, and a radar exchange signals, and you can't infer from what you, you can't figure out from that how to answer the radar's challenge and get it to tell the gun not to fire at you. On the other hand, if somebody were to compromise, if the position would be overrun, the keying material in the radar would be compromised, then if you could make use of it, that intelligence fast enough, you could inform a whole theater of battle, perhaps, how to pretend to be your opponent's aircraft, and then you could have carte blanche. On the Unix system, entirely different issue. Didn't do anything about shoulder surfing. Right? That's a well-known problem. And the passwords are used over and over again. But on the other hand, it made the password table non-secret. And that has tremendous advantages for system administration. It means you can pass the password table entries around relatively freely. OK, so <clears throat> it's actually. I had been thinking about two problems for quite a while. 1965, one of my NSA cleared friends mistakenly, I'm very grateful for this mistake, told me that they encrypted the telephones within their own building. Now, that wasn't true. It isn't true. I mean, they have secure phones and lots of desks. They could call each other on those now. But the basic way they do it is that they have a separate phone system running in shielded conduit and separate secure phone closets and uh, so forth. They, they don't use cryptography for that purpose. But I believed him. And I didn't understand what good that would do you, because I had a very countercultural point of view in 1965. 
That is to say, I couldn't understand what good cryptography would do you if, if you were going to have somebody else who'd be able to read the traffic other than the two people talking on the phone. And if you had any scheme, I mean, I, I imagine things like, you know, what's called net keying, that had the same key throughout the building or something, and I didn't see the advantage of that. Turns out they didn't either. Um, the other problem, 1970, when I arrived at Stanford, John McCarthy had just come back from Bordeaux, giving a paper on what we would now call internet commerce. He thought of it as buying and selling via home terminals. And I began thinking about a paperless office, I and mean, then thinking, out what would you do to make up for signature? So altogether, so I had one problem was five years old, one problem was ten years old, and the spring, there's some week in the spring of 1975, which for an amusing reason has been lost. I mean, if it's in my records, I can't find it, the date. But I realized, um, I somehow recognized that you could potentially solve the problem of signature, that you could have a way of transforming a message um, that other that that other people could recognize but but couldn't reproduce, and a few days later I realized this could be turned around to solve the key management problem. I came up with this notion we now call public and private keys that there'd be one key that transformed a message in one direction, and there'd be another key that you couldn't derive from the public key that transformed it in the other direction. And I was acutely aware that this was, a, you know, unlike lots of stuff I had been working on, kept my notes on the computer and so forth, I understood this was really valuable. I knew the computer wasn't secure, so I didn't, I, I didn't write it down. Uh, my, my wife came home about 6 in the evening. I told her about it. I fed her dinner. I, I, was, I was the house husband. And then I went downhill to where... Uh, where Marty lived, he lived right down, lives right downhill from where John McCarthy lived at that time, and it took me an hour to persuade him this would work. Right? That we didn't know how to do it, but that it was not impossible. And in, after an hour, he suddenly, you know, recognized it, and he said, "I have an invitation from Jim Massey to write an invited paper for the Transactions in Information Theory. How would you like to join me on that?" And that is the paper that became New Directions in Cryptography. Now, what I'm trying to, to bring out is what happened next is public key cryptography had two impacts. One, it's useful. Right? At a minimal estimate of its usefulness, incidentally, I mean, it took cryptography from a non-starter to an also-ran in, in, in open network security. Yeah, I'll come back to that point. The other was that it's really very hard for an abstract, a sort of an academic uh, community to develop a cryptographic tradition. And the reason is that if what you really want to do is encrypt things, as opposed to really wanting to spy on somebody, then it's much easier to cook up crypto systems than to break them. You have to get quite a distance before you're in the position where the people who know how to break things can break any random proposal you make. You really have to go think about it. So if you look at the way public cryptography was circa 1975, right? just about, you, you go look at the literature, you get some jackass proposals that are now seen as very trivially breakable, but the fact is, there, you have somebody, <laughs> I think, um, Untermeyer, in one of his books, describes somebody as having, having written a lot of poetry of the kind that was easier to write than to read. Right? <laughs> and this is the way cryptographic systems, they were easier to design than to break, and you know, they, they sort of proliferated. Now, that creates a problem. You see, if you have an actual NSA-like national intelligence community, then you have real traffic coming to you, and you really want to read it. So people get really motivated to break systems, and then you turn that expertise to evaluation of your own systems. Um, <clears throat> but without that, it's very hard to get started. The advantage of public key cryptography was it presented a problem whose solution was not obvious. You can't just cook up a public key system that looks to it, you know, looks to you as though it works uh, trivially. I mean. Uh, okay, so there's a, a Brit named Clifford Cox who solved the problem we call RSA in six or eight hours, but Clifford Cox is remarkable. But basically, um, it's, I mean, and note that you know, only a 
handful of solutions to the problem have now been discovered in the 30 years or so this problem has been widely studied. So that gave focus. We worked the public community, which held its first, probably its first real, first crypto was held at the University of California, uh, Santa Barbara in 1981 and have been held steadily ever since then. First Eurocrypt, although it was not called that, was held the following spring uh, in Germany in 1982. And those have floated around, and they've been held every year since. And each of those meetings gets, well, they started out around 50, but very quickly they grew to 200, and then sometimes as high as 500. So we have a worldwide community of, say, you know, 1,000 or 1,500 steady participants uh, working on cryptographic issues. And the result of that is that the whole subject has actually become rather well cooked. And the current state of affairs is that we are into what I'll call second generation public key crypto systems. Uh, the first generation use modular arithmetic. They do it in two different ways. The, the one that Marty Hellman and I discovered is called Diffie-Hellman key negotiation, and just involves the commutativity properties of exponentials. Uh, the RSA system involves the difficulty of factoring versus multiplying. And that one, uh, both of them have the characteristic that they are a little bit bulky relative to what appear to be the prospects for solving the associated factoring and discrete logarithm problems. So in order to get a cryptographic system that is strong enough, you need to use 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 bits. And concern about this has been, been widespread. All the systems are still widely in use and will be for decades. In 1980, five or seven or so, two different and very different people. One named Neil Koblitz, who's at the University of Washington, and one named Victor Miller, who was then at IBM and is now at Center for Communications Research, the NSA consultancy in Princeton, developed what's called elliptic curve cryptography. And the whole idea is, you know, conceptually very simple. You find some more complicated arithmetic and you can make the numbers smaller. And elliptic, what are called elliptic curve groups come out of a bunch of hairy, 19th century or perhaps earlier mathematics. Uh, and in the 20 years since then, they have evolved to where that is now the, what is seen as the, as the upcoming. It's not as widely used yet as the first generation stuff, but it will be. And gosh, there's so many threads here. The one I want to bring up is that we're finally getting some sort of reasonable coordination between the activities of NS NSA and its friends and the public community. And they have accepted what seems to me to have been inevitable. That is to say they have now put forth, they, I guess I should go back and apologize. 1997, the US saw the need to replace the data encryption standard. The data encryption standard had been designed as a compromise between what was seen as the needs of civilian security and the needs of intelligence. So it was supposed to be strong enough for all the applications it was intended for, but not so strong that they didn't think maybe they could break it if they really you know, bestirred themselves. And it had 64-bit blocks and 56-bit keys. And as I said, it was in use, it's still in use, it would be in use for quite a while. 1997, after a long time that I haven't described to you of a sort of tug of war over the right of anybody other than the government to use cryptography, basically, the Bureau of Standards, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, began a project to develop the replacement for DES that was entirely different. And that, that project, called regrettably the Advanced Encryption Standard, had eventually selected one, a cryptographic system designed in Belgium. Right? A cryptographic system that supports three keying modes, 128 bits, 192 bits, and 256 bits. The, nobody I know knows how to reduce those work factors. The system appears to be as strong as its key length suggests. 
Um, it uses very, very straightforward combination of table lookups and uh, Galois arithmetic uh, to do its mixing. It can be implemented in parallel in such a way that you can get one block of ciphertext out of it for every round time. It has, in its strongest mode, 14 rounds. And so it's a very efficient and very secure system. And a year or so after it was adopted as a federal standard, the Committee on National Security Systems of DOD put out a memorandum, its policy memorandum 15, certifying, uh, authorizing uh, AES for all levels of classified traffic. It's a very complicated bureaucratic memorandum to read, but it has a perfectly clear paragraph in it. It says, for secret and below, any of the keying modes is OK. For top secret information, you have to use one of the two larger ones. This was augmented two years later. NSA's publishing, or beginning to publish, we don't have enough detail yet to do the implementations to a level of compatibility that we'd like. It announced what it called Suite B. Suite A is presumably the bunch of uh, secret crypto systems, names like Juniper, that they have been using for several years. Suite B is a cognate set of systems, many of which are federal standards. The Advanced Encryption Standard, Secure Hash Algorithm for sizes 256 and 384, and several um, elliptic curve an elliptic curve digital signature algorithm and either elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman or an algorithm called MQV, which is a better key negotiation algorithm developed by Menezes, Ku, and Vanstone. So you now have, and in principle at least, a public set of algorithms certified for all levels of US traffic. Um, and thereby good for a whole lot of uses in civilian government with coalition forces, et cetera. So let me try to now pontificate, use my last 10 minutes or so to pontificate about sort of the command, what I see as the civilian command and control problem. Right? So command and control for one thing is a, a funny phrase with a mildly amusing history. I know when I, my wife first heard the phrase, she said, you know, what's the difference? It sounds redundant. And I got to thinking and I thought, well, you know, a general has command authority. So imagine the general, and the general wakes up in the morning and his orderly brings breakfast in the newspaper, and he, you know, quietly reads the paper for half an hour, and then he thinks I'm getting late, I should do some work today. And so he calls in his aide and uh, says to his aide, you know, go tell the troops to shoot at the enemy. And his aide salutes and goes off, and he goes back to reading the paper. And another half hour, he's beginning to get nervous because he hasn't heard back from his aide. He begins thinking, you know, well, maybe the aide made it down to the front and told the troops to shoot at the enemy, and they're shooting at the enemy, and the enemy have been routed. Uh, or maybe the enemy shot back and we've been routed. Or maybe the snipers got the aide and he never got to them. Right? So basically, what is needed to turn command authority into something real is what's called the control system. That is the feedback system that tells you what the results of the commands are and what the situation is. And in the late 40s, there was a project called the Strategic Air Command Control System. And somehow the part of that that stuck was command and control. So that, that notion, under various meanings, was around in mostly government use for a very long time. When I arrived at MITRE, what we called command and control is what would now be called, you know, GUI interface or something like that. I mean, it was getting information up on screens in ways that people in war rooms could read it and understand it. It replaced, you know, pushing ships around on maps and things like that with, uh, with pool cues. Uh, at Sandia, it meant a much more technical set of problems that have to do with the dreadful communications environment after a bunch of nuclear weapons go off. And how to you may economize, roughly speaking, on the amount of keying material necessary to control uh, a range of options in the authorization of use of your nuclear weapons. Um, but in general, right, if you look at what you're interested in, this is a the all, I think all of the basic principles are in common. That is to say, this is a security subject that you're designing systems that are meant to be, to tolerate attack. 
And in so doing, you have the same principles whether you are controlling the strategic bombers or controlling the electric grid. And the funny thing about it is, you know, it seems the electric grid is much more real. And this brings up, let me see if I've got all of them. I mean, there's about three parallels, it seems to me, between the problems we faced in cryptography and, and the ones you face here. One is a question of knowing your enemies. For all through this argument about the use of cryptography, NSA would consistently argue that, in effect, we had no real civilian world. We had no, you know, nobody wanted to read our traffic. What are we kidding ourselves, et cetera? Now, that's a very important point because they knew who their enemies were. Because they're an intelligence organization, because they're busy spying on other people, they, one, discover who's spying on them, and two, know what the impact of spying is. They know how they profit from spying on somebody else's communications, and so they know how somebody else might be sp profit from spying on our own. I think SAC has the same insight, and I think that the electric utility operators and factory manufacturing and all the various things that use SCADA systems uh, have much less insight into this. Second point is volume of products. Right? The largest, I don't know currently, I'm not quite up to date, but it was a big seller in the NSA world when they made 100,000 of something. I think there may have been 100,000 KL7s. There were nearly half a million STU3s. But that's, if you look at commercial application, smart cards with crypto in them, um, oh, the biggest success is presumably SSL. Every browser has SSL in it. Right? Millions and millions and millions of these things. So the whole scale, by already by the, by the early 90s, it seemed clear that the civilian scale, civilian um, cryptographic market had way outrun uh, the military cryptographic market. And I think the same thing is probably true of civilian infrastructure control. There's just plain much more of it, much more money invested in it, et cetera. And in a world where it looks less and less likely we're going to get blown up with a nuclear weapon, and more and more likely that we're going to be in constant terrorist, economic, you know, many kinds of low-grade competition with lots of our neighbors and internal factions, et cetera. The security of the civilian infrastructure is at least as important as the security of the military infrastructure. The final point, and this one is, this is the one that makes the civilian cryptography, civilian command and control more difficult than the military, is that what really makes things hard is diversity of authority. Remember earlier I said the public key took cryptography from a non-starter to an also-ran. And what do I mean by that? Right? I mean, it was clearly, now look at the U.S. <coughs> ComSec materials control system. It has a route called the Central Facility in, Ma in Maryland, in a couple of pieces. And that thing manufactures, in some sense, all, used literally to be all, but it's top-down, basically manufactures the keying material for all U.S. government, civilian government and military use. Now, that's very convenient because particularly look at the military. The military is fairly large, right? Over a million people employed. But everybody knows the command structure, chain of command. Everybody knows the president, the secretary of defense, the joint chiefs, the various four-star commands on down to where you are. And that centrality, that unity of purpose, gives them the luxury of appointing, quote, the executive agent for communication security, and that is NSA. And they're giving NSA the dictatorial power to say what, what equipment you will use for information you classify. If you class, commands have authority over classification, but once they classify something, NSA has authority over how they handle it in, in telecommunication requirements. And now look at the whole world. Look at the internet, right? There are 192 countries. There are a lot more jurisdictions than that. There are thousands of standards. There are presumably tens of thousands of companies. <laughs> There's a, a, a vast diversity of purposes, allegiances, etc. There is nobody who can be assigned who would be trusted as the executive authority for information security for the whole world. The same thing is true if you look at civilian infrastructure, command, and control.
There is no one authority there. There are lots of companies trading their authority against governing bodies, etc. But there's a constant tug of war at lots and lots of, of dissolving boundaries. And so you have an intrinsically more difficult problem than the Strategic Air Command had 60 years ago when it was facing uh, the problem of a worldwide, worldwide deployment of force. So that's where I think I, I'll leave you. And I hope you found that inspiring. I see at least it wasn't so terrific. Nobody nodded off. Can't tell you how much that warms the heart of a speaker. So thank you very much. Uh, you want to help me with questions now? Right. Uh, okay. For, for the questions, we, we would like you to ask questions on the mic so the virtual people can hear it as well. Are there any questions in the audience? I'll kick it off with our first virtual question. Um, Pierce McKiernan, a self-proclaimed proud Irishman <laughs> from Harvard, is asking what your view on the Cayley Purser algorithm is, if that's not too obscure. So obscure for me. Okay. I, it was obscure to me, uh, too. So. I mean, I guess it's some uh, algorithm that an Irish uh, an Irishman invented. That, so we don't have interaction with this guy. Kay I mean, Cayley is a famous mathematician in the 19th century. Uh, I'll, I'll ask Pierce to send me some more information on that. Any, other, any questions in the audience? I had one that, um, one that I, I kind of found interesting. When you were talking about cost of evaluation, you said that uh, for a crypto system, cost of evaluation may be the biggest cost in, you know, over the lifetime. When, when we were looking at the public algorithms in the 70s and 80s, when did... Did you, did you see any point where the public or, or certainly large companies felt that the cost of evaluation had been borne by the community and they felt like they didn't have to shoulder it themselves? Oh, no, I think that was almost um, early. That is to say, the, the real significance of DES uh, as a system was that it was endorsed by the government and so from a corporate point of view, it's not, I mean, it's a rational explanation, not clear that I don't have any sort of insider knowledge that this is their thinking, but IBM took a lot of things that were plausible trade secrets, published them, released them as the data encryption thing, as its, its submission thing became the data encryption standard. And what it got in return for that was, uh, one would presume, a reasonable, um, freedom from liability under an implied warranty of fitness doctrine. Because they say, we're, just we're just like anyone else, we are conforming with the federal standard. If it weren't a federal standard and it were broken and their banks lost, it lost $10 million or something, then they'd be in a position of having to trot out Conheim and Feistel and Tritter and the rest of the bunch who worked on this, you know, and give expert testimony in court and get second guessed and so forth and have themselves in a minefield. And so uh, I think that a lot of this has been about passing the buck around. And I don't think that in the commercial and civilian world, you're going to find a clear accounting of what the cost of evaluation is. But if you look, for example, at the AES project, there you see something that in which, one, it is claimed that NSA spent more money, more, more person hours on its evaluation of AES than on any of its other algorithms. I don't have the figures. I don't know if that's true. But I certainly know that about, I think, 30 of them came to the first AES meeting. It was fewer at the second one, which was in Rome. Uh, but um, they, they spent a lot of effort on it. Hundreds of people in the public community spent a lot of effort on it. And so I think if you compare that with, say, the strict development effort, that is, Damon and Ryman working on their PhD theses for a period of, say, you know, four years. You have, loosely speaking, two-person years, while there are other people, Kaiser Nyberg, had, they took a major component of hers uh, and used it. So it's a few people to develop it, and um, hundreds of people working on the evaluation. Now, having said, having said this, it strikes me, I'm talking, so to speak, about the purely cryptographic component. This is always dwarfed by the implementation costs. 
So, I mean, you're talking people are you know, making chips to do this, people writing programs to do this, people building systems. Cryptography is only a small part of the cost of secure systems. It have, it's a, somehow, you know, we've gotten more of our sh than our share of credit and uh, public attention and so forth. But uh, the implementation costs always dwarf the theory, have all so far dwarfed the theory costs. Okay, thanks. And any ah. couple questions up here? Good. Darren Highfill from Internex Corporation. Um, curious, uh, as you start to describe the uh, the emerging challenges with uh, distributed uh, key generation, uh, no central authority, it, it started to remind me a lot of the topics and discussions that are going on in the areas of identity management these days and wondering if you see strong links between the two worlds and if so, what do you see as the important emerging issues? Well, I mean, I think, yeah, I think they're very similar in that uh, when we talk about particular, about federated identity management, and that is a function of the fact that you have a multiplicity of authorities. The strictly key production issue, um, I didn't mention, that comes, that's another interesting sort of falling cost of doing business matter. Um, before, I don't know, 80s or something like that, I, I believe literally all the keys for the U.S. government were manufactured at the central facility. And that's because the, the key thing in key manufacture is reliability. Right? You have random number devices and you have constantly to be monitoring them to be sure that they haven't gone sour. You have to base that monitoring on exactly what your random process is and what ways it's likely to go sour. So some of them will get stuck at zero, but some of them will do much more subtle things like go into short loops or something. So um, the cost of the electronics to do the monitoring came down to a point whereby in the 80s you could begin to have local production of keys for many purposes. And in the public world, we set up this paradigm uh, that I think is one of our sound contributions, which is you manufacture your keys locally, but you get them certified by somebody central so that you can introduce yourself to other people. And the, in some sense, the fact there might be a failure of local manufacturing is mitigated by the fact that there are lots of local manufacturers. Therefore, for an opponent, finding the fault and exploiting it and the total amount of damage that will be done uh, if there is such a fault, are limited relative to the risks of centralizing all of this, which may or may not be operationally or politically feasible, but even if it is, there's a lot to be said for local localization of these things. I'm Rob Lambert. I'm from Certicom Corp. <laughs> I, uh, I, have a, I really enjoyed your historical background on stream ciphers, etc., and it was my impression that a lot of the stream cipher Concentration was happening in Europe during the 70s and 80s. And oh well, some, for some reason, um, the, your, the 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 communities in Europe and the U.S. developed somewhat different tastes yes. in the 1980s, and crypto was largely about number theoretic things and about quote theory, which has to do with the connection of cryptography with the theory of NP complexity and and a bunch of abstractions that. You know, so very attractive to listen to uh, mixed understanding. I have mixed understanding of whether they have how much application they have to reality. I can't tell whether I'm just an old fogey or whether these are uh, irrelevant young theories. But uh, Europe, for some reason, a, I remember particularly in 87 in Amsterdam, well, in 84 in Paris, and a bunch of them, a whole lot of study of systems that effectively had been around uh, types of systems that had been around in either in in government usages or in that market of somebody I drove over was from Brown Bovary who were one of many manufacturers who basically you had you had civilian manufacturer but you largely had government customers and there was a, a whole cryptographic technology that dates from circa 1950 uh, that we began analyzing publicly in the 80s at, Eurocrypts. I don't think most of that was genuinely new in, new in the world. I wonder if you could comment on the kind of the resurgence of the stream cipher mode, things like CCM and GCM and those Well, modes. I mean, all, 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 most of the encrypted bits transmitted in the world are encrypted and transmitted in stream modes. 
But when you say a distinction between block ciphers and stream ciphers, I mean, to my mind, the formal de distinction is this. They're all stream ciphers. A stream cipher is a block cipher if there exists an n with the property that given any n consecutive bits, you can find the one bit before and the bit after. Right. And, um, but that doesn't that that formalism doesn't really you know the critical point is there are some different styles and it's a question of whether you're keeping enough state at every moment to go back as well as forward and a whole lot of these things don't uh, and whether and it it saves you effort to not save state and maybe it costs you something in security not to save state so I think we had time for one more. We could spend the time Sorry on the about history that. of Certicom, which is buried in issues like that. They, uh Ralph Langer from Langer Communications Germany. Uh, I must say I'm uh, uh, very impressed and a little bit puzzled by your closing statements. Uh, if you look at the uh, civil organizations like asset owners and vendors, we don't have chain of command. And uh, most of these organizations. But you do within, within any individual. Within, one. yes. Oh, right. But not uh, with, w between the players. Uh, and if and we don't we have lots of organizations that don't know their enemies they don't know uh, the vulnerabilities and they even don't know uh, the damage that can be done so my question is uh, is technology alone sufficient to prevent us from the damage that we want to prevent or aren't there uh, much more different factors that we have to consider well I think you always have to consider factors larger than technology Right? I mean, we're working in technology for application to a society run by business and political phenomena. Right? So if you're asking questions um, like, you know, do you have to pay attention to staffing or something like that? Of course you do. Um, I think, in fact, I've been, being a crypto enthusiast, and this would be a whole nother talk, a slow convert to the notion that static, proactive security measures essential, delightful, etc., but will never be adequate for doing business in the kind of world we have. And so that I was slow to come to the recognition that um, virus scanning and honey pots and uh, forensics, that all of these things were essential components uh, of, well, if I have two minutes, let me, let me put it this way. Look at, look at a, um, Look at the military style, circa either of the world wars. You have one, what happens to you happens all at once. You key your radio and transmit. At that point, you have to presume that intercept organizations picked up your signal as well as the people you were sending to. There's nothing further you can do about that. Right? There's traffic that NSA worked on for whole people's lifetimes. The Venona problem started in 45, was ended in 78. Certain people worked on that problem their entire careers. Right. Um, and further, there's nothing, you know, no, no, nobody you appeal to. You know, you, you transmit traffic, it's badly encrypted, it gets read, you get beaten in battle. Right? Well, that's how it goes. You know, right? now, today it's, so it has three characteristics. Right? One, it's non-interactive. You do something and they get to do a lot that you don't see. They can sit and analyze for a long time. May I'm doing some good, it may not. Right? Two, it's, there's no higher appeals, there's no point in forensics and things of that kind. And is today's situation, is, oh, and three, that was largely about sort of information disclosure. Dirty tricks and uh, uh, manipulations, uh, things like that, were less a feature. They were, but less a feature than just plain intercept and intelligence. Today, you have, from the point of view of a webmaster or network security officer, you have three critical things. One, it's all interactive. Right? Two, it's largely about um, actions that will damage you as opposed to leakage of information. You have a website that's largely devoted to handing out information. You don't, right? You're not interested, not very concerned about who gets the information. And somebody comes in and you know, manipulates your website and posts different information. That concerns you a lot. Um, 
three, there is higher authority to oppose. Most of these things are operating under national and international law. And consequently, things like forensics, so that if you're attacked and if you're exploited, you can collect information that will later allow you to go in another arena and strike back. So I think that a much more dynamic, I think the static machinery is desirable where you can use it. But in some sense, and this is what I meant by public key cryptography being an also ran, you really need to communicate with people you don't even know well enough for the key negotiation to be very meaningful in terms of whether you trust them. Right? And so um, you are basically, you know, salesmen talk about qualifying a customer. Right? They look at the customer's card, how the customer's dressed, what the customer says, and so forth, and, and make a fairly fast decision. Does this customer have 100 million in pocket or 50 cents? And decide to go ahead. And that's what fundamentally you're doing with a website. You're trying to decide how much resources is it worth communicating with these people. Well, that's, that sounds like a problem cryptography can't possibly solve for you. And to take it into another area, right, where digital signatures and that kind of technology is very much used, look at authentication of software. Right? The essential point about the authenticity of a Solaris system out of Sun is not the fact that you can get it either packaged in plastic or digitally signed. It's the fact that, you, that if you're concerned, you know there's an internal, aside from the fact that the code is now all public and gone entirely to open source, so you can audit it yourself. You can also audit the mechanism by which things are checked out of libraries, worked on, reviewed by people, signed back in, etc. So it's the human processes here that I think uh, dominate.